Hello, bonjour, welcome everyone. My name is Paul Keefe, Business Advisor here at the World Trade Center in Winnipeg. I would like to first begin by respectfully acknowledging that this webinar is coming to you from Treaty 1 territory, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. Thank you for joining our webinar and introduction to market research, which will be presented by Ivanka Watkin. Before we begin, I want to share a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions, please send them uh, just to the, the chat box on the top of your screen. And uh, Ivanka will try to answer as many as she can during a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. For all logistical questions, please send them directly to the chat box and I will answer your questions as soon as possible. And lastly, you'll also receive a PDF copy and recording of this presentation within the next week. Now it's time to start our webinar. I would like to introduce you to Ivanka Watkin. Naturally curious, Ivanka is well suited for her role as the market research specialist here at the World Trade Center Winnipeg. She has two bachelor degrees, Central and Eastern European Studies with a minor in Ukrainian and a double major in German and Russian. She also holds a master's in business administration, which involves okay. studies both in Winnipeg and abroad. And Ivanka's the, extensive globe trotting experiences bolster her understanding of international markets and cultures, adding value to her domain and market research locally and internationally. Welcome, Ivanka. The floor is all yours. Great. Thanks, Paul. Hey, everyone. So I'm Ivanka, and I'm the marketing research specialist at the World Trade Center, Winnipeg. Market research should be a dynamic part of any business plan. Overall, keeping a finger on the pulse of the market will give you better prospects and chances of success. Our journey today will take us through marketing research fundamentals. First, I'll define marketing research and why it's important, then differentiate the kinds of market research, touch on the three codes that'll help categorize your offerings, and we'll go through some other things worth considering when you're researching and end with a case study. Before we dive in, we should first define what marketing research actually is. The Business Development Bank of Canada defines market research as the process of gathering and analyzing information about customers, competitors, and emerging trends that help companies make strategic planning decisions about marketing and selling their products and services. Now that we know what marketing research is, why do we care? Where is the value of your market research for your business journey? To help guide your market research and analysis, you have to maintain your marketing mix, also known as the four Ps. This is often considered the core of a marketing plan. The basic marketing mix encompasses the key factors you must understand before introducing your offerings to the public. Product, which answers what the target market wants or needs, and if they would like your current offerings. Price, which contributes toward perception of your product, answers the question of what the target audience is willing to pay. Place, answering if this is the best location for your company. And promotion, which involves knowing your target audience well enough to successfully inform them about your offerings. Remember, your target market is dynamic and it's going to change over time, so the four Ps must be maintained throughout your business journey. Let's break down the four Ps, starting with product. We're answering the question, what does the target market want and would they like your product? Does your product fulfill an unanswered need? It doesn't necessarily mean the need is implicit for a survival, but that it can make life more convenient, fills a gap in the market, or provides the consumer with something desirable in some way. Boston University defines culture as all the ways of life, including arts, beliefs, and institutions of a population that are passed down from generation to generation. Culture has been called the way of life for an entire society. As such, it includes codes of manners, dress language, religion, rituals, art. You may have to tailor your product in some way to fit local cultural norms and expectations, whether it's here or abroad. Competition refers to products similar to yours that are already available in the market. WTCW can simplify this process by providing a company list that details potential competitors so that you can better decide how to position your business and its products and services. 
When considering alternatives, it might not refer to what you initially think. It instead concerns what your customer can do instead of engaging with your product or service, however unrelated it may seem. In other words, what else can be done with the same amount of time and energy to get the same need fulfilled? Is it an adventure or a thrill, a way of gaining status, or maybe eating a delicious dessert? Next, we'll look at price, which answers how much are they willing to pay? Consider economic differences and local distribution of wealth for your target region. You have to decide who your target customer is, what they might expect to pay, and why. Pricing can also affect the perception of a product. If something is low cost, the automatic assumption is that it's cheap, low quality, generally not good. Think like the dollar store. If something is high cost, it creates exclusivity or a lack of accessibility, which becomes attractive because of its perception of being highly, highly desirable and rare, related more to status and wealth. Competitive pricing can be challenging, Generally, lowering your price that you're more attractive than other competitors should be your absolute last resort. Once you lower your price, it's very difficult to raise it again without putting off your customers. Sometimes a higher price is actually more desirable. However, if your product is commodified, so something that's plentiful and generally inexpensive, consumers are less willing to be brand loyal than if it's perceived as being special and exclusive in some way. With available alternatives, consumers often, often consider trade-offs with pricing. If they pay more, maybe they have a more exclusive product or service or something that is higher quality or specialized in some way, than, more specialized in some way than if they bought a less expensive product, which may be more prone to breakage or is at least perceived in that way. According to the Corporate Finance Institute, there's three types of transaction uh, foreign exchange risk. Excuse me. Transaction risk, when a company here has operations in a different country, then tries to move its earnings back home without the exchange rate changing between the transaction and the settlement. Economic risk, where a company's market value is impacted by totally unavoidable exposure to exchange rate fluctuations from macroeconomic conditions like government regulations or geopolitical issues. And translation risk, when a Canadian a uh, headquartered company conducts business in a foreign country, but its financial performance is in Canadian currency. Now let's look at place. This answer is if the best location, if this is the best location for your strategy. Think about the location where your business functions will be, from where you may be sourcing, and where your target market may be. Especially when sourcing abroad, businesses must consider the political atmosphere and local laws of that location. Are there geopolitical issues, corruption, high regulation and taxation, or even a low ease of doing business score in that country? If sourcing in Canada is a hostility or favorability toward what you may be sourcing or toward the practices of the business with which you interact? You must also consider if there are different laws and regulations in each region, which can vary per province. Changes to local laws can also impact your ability to function optimally and must be watched and anticipated to the best of your ability so that you can tailor your logistics strategy accordingly. Social culture can have a huge, huge impact as well. What are the societal expectations? Businesses must consider social norms and expectations of their target market. Going against them will cost you. Business practices and business culture overlap with social culture and political atmosphere. Canadians tend to take for granted the expected customs and norms within our business interactions. To be able to learn and understand how to interact with foreign business cultural practices, we must first have a deep understanding of our own norms and expectations. If you'd like to learn more about these differences and how they can affect your business, I'll go into them more in my next webinar, to which you are all invited. Logistical issues have topped news headlines since the pandemic. Consider that geopolitical issues, natural disasters, and sometimes even unforeseen mistakes can all negatively impact your business's ability to bring in your supplies or export your products abroad. Promotion answers how you will inform the target audience about your product. It's 
wise to look at existing successful and unsuccessful strategies in marketing promotion. Why were they successful? What was the key reason that the strategy fell apart? Should it have worked or not? And why? Reading through existing case studies can help you avoid some mistakes and utilize the successful strategies of others. Culture, which we defined earlier, should strongly influence your promotional strategy. Even tailoring to subcultures within the broader culture can help your business speak more closely to an individual's perceived needs. According to National Geographic, demography is the study of demographics, the social characteristics and statistics of the human population. This study of the size, age structures, and economics of different populations can be used for a variety of purposes like marketing promotion or overall business strategy. Popular media sources are a good way to offer push and pull marketing. Push marketing actively seeks out ways to put your information in front of your target customer. With Facebook and Instagram, for example, you can choose to actively promote and push your ads to a demographic that you think would be interested in your product or services. Email lists, texts, and private messages are also examples of push marketing strategies. Pull marketing is more passive. In a social media setting, it would mean creating content and maintaining your page, answering messages, and so on. Because the market is dynamic, you must actively maintain your four Ps. World Trade Center Winnipeg has access to several reports, surveys, insights involving business domestically as well as abroad. Not only can we pull reports on the industry and potential competitors, we can also look up information about positioning and alternatives that you can use to tailor your marketing strategy. What are the different kinds of market research? On a higher level, there are two groupings of market research types, primary and secondary, and then qualitative and quantitative. Primary research is the data obtained firsthand by going directly to this source rather than searching through existing collections of information, databases, or libraries. This is not an exhaustive list. The researcher either conducts the research directly themselves or commissions the data to be collected on their behalf. Secondary research is much easier to obtain. It has already been compiled, gathered, organized, and published by others. Here we have three categories, public, such as government department reports, commercial, such as info from industry associations, and educational, such as student work. This again is not an exhaustive list. Secondary research is the main source of information we use at WTC Winnipeg, where we have access to private databases that not only gather secondary research, but often conduct their own primary research. Quantitative data is measurable with numbers. It explores who, when, where, how many, how often, and so on. Qualitative data is based on perception and other data that is not necessarily measurable by numbers. It explores why people feel or behave the way that they do. If you can only afford to do research of one type, make sure it's the right type to suit your questions and that you're asking the right ones. Small Business BC put out a great little list of common research mistakes that apply to both qualitative and quantitative research. First, know the questions you need answers to before you look for the data. Next, know whether the info you are getting is from a reputable source. Research your research materials. Double check the information and check the dates of when the data was collected. Know your target demographic before researching so that you can keep relevant parameters in mind. One set of data is just not enough to get an objective understanding. Collect info from multiple sources to gain more of a holistic, unbiased view. You cannot use a survey group of only family and friends because of their lack of objectivity. Better to speak with those affected by or in the industry, such as customers or potential customers. Lastly, as an individual, you see the world different than the next person. Your perception is shaped by your experiences and understanding of the world. This can be occasionally problematic because it can affect how you process new information and analyze data. When you're totally unsure of where to start, this is a good place. These three codes will help you categorize your business and offerings so you can better navigate your intended market. 
Here's an example of a NAICS code list sourced from Stats Canada. The North American Industry Classification System, or NAICS, is a standardized system developed by the stats agencies of Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. It's used to classify businesses for collecting, analyzing, and publishing data related to North American economies. When you ID your industry code, you can find industry reports on industry life cycles, averages, trends, and keywords, and you can ID potential competitors. Here's an example sourced from sickcode.com. US sick codes categorize the industries that companies belong to based on their business activities. They've been mostly replaced by the standardized NAICS, but can still be useful because they're granular. Lastly, we have an HS code example sourced from the World Customs Organization. The harmonized system is an internationally standardized numerical method of classifying traded products for the process of exporting goods. By identifying your offerings HS codes, you'll be able to find the tariffs associated with your exports. Other things to consider. The Global Trade Help Desk can give you an overview of your offerings export potential in foreign markets. Investopedia defines the market economy as an economic system in which economic decisions and the pricing of goods and services are guided by the interactions of a country's individual citizens and businesses. It's guided by the laws of supply and demand, although there may be government intervention or central planning that changes, over, that changes outcomes that would otherwise be guided by the market. Market consistency refers to whether there are fluctuations within the market or if it stays relatively stable over time. Market size refers to the number of people or companies who could be potential customers. Market saturation refers to the volume of a product or service within a market. For example, if a market is oversaturated, it would not be a good fit for entry for your product because local demand would be low. And cultural product ad adaptation refers to the process of tailoring your offerings to align with the culture of the local market. Consider values, preferences, consumer behavior, and so on. These are some common sources for high quality information. I do caution you, however, to still cross check your info when possible. For example, I was searching for information regarding cassava production in the Philippines. Although the government website boasted a strong crop that year, all other non-governmental data actually showed a decrease in production for the region. Remember, you don't know what you don't know. So distilling information from a holistic viewpoint will be your best tactic. Get information from everywhere possible so you can get a big picture and go from there. <clears throat> we had a customer approach us a while back about opening a toy store in St. Boniface. For this industry, there was a lot of information. Keep in mind that if your industry is less popular than the toy industry, is newer or disruptive in some way, or the accessible information is lower quality and maybe less reliable, the available data may be more limited than what you see in this case. At the time this report was made, it was during one of the heights of the bottlenecks in supply chain due to the Russian war on Ukraine and rising demand after the pandemic. Bottlenecks equal sourcing issues, particularly if you are importing products such as toys made in Europe or China. Recent developments will almost always have an impact on the four Ps. For example, if this toy store has a sought after high in demand toy in limited stock or a short supply, the market equilibrium of the price will be higher. The toy store can charge more for the item because the demand is high and the supply is low. This would therefore affect the price aspect of the four Ps. Further, if new Canadian regulations lower the carbon footprint in the retail sector are going to affect where the toy store is able to source toys or perhaps what they are made of or even how they're packaged and transported, this will force the business to change its sourcing and logistics strategy. This will, negatively, will likely negatively affect the price aspect of the four Ps as well as place as sourcing locally tends to be much more expensive because of higher wages for those making toys here. Product of the four Ps is affected as higher quality raw materials for toys and environmentally friendly packaging is, at least for now, also more expensive, as is, for example, transporting items locally instead of by boat from a lesser developed country. 
The demand by retailers resulting from the new government regulations will affect the market as these products and services will become higher in demand while simultaneously lowering the supply, thus increasing the overhead expenses for the toy business. All this while also assuming that there will be a strong enough demand for these toy products. It's vital that you have multiple high quality sources for your information and that you understand the depth of the implications of things such as new laws and regulations or how war abroad can affect your ability to supply a seemingly unrelated product or service. This is an older example, but at the time it was pulled, it was very up to date. Make sure your intelligence is recent so that it's applicable to, be, to your needs, otherwise you risk basing your decisions on irrelevant information. Here's more from the same report. The snapshot section is nice because it provides a visual snapshot of the business behind the industry. Everything here seems good except for maybe the profit margin. The industry structure section below provides useful information about the industry as a whole and its trends. This is meant to be higher level info and an easy to understand visual summary. This is a useful graphic from the same report, which relates back to the four P's of marketing, particularly price, because it will give the toy company an idea of their potential profit margin. This graphic breaks down the cost structure of the industry, which is specific to hobby and toy stores. At the bottom, you'll notice total revenue of the industry. By comparing these numbers to the cost structure, we can better understand the toy store's anticipated costs, which will influence their pricing strategy. Further, this may affect place in the business's four Ps, as it will make more sense to source their products in a particular place, whether that's here or abroad. Product aspect of the four Ps will also be affected by the decisions they make based on their cost structure and price, pricing strategies. Here's another glimpse into the same report, breaking down industry performance even further. You can see at the top that it's summarized, then further comments on the industry's performance over five years to 2022, discusses the issues of rising competition and continues in discussing the industry forecasts positive outlook over five years to 2027. <clears throat> Note that this particular information is from 2020. Although it's somewhat older, it would still give us a good idea of what to expect now. We would generally want to stay away from information older than five years, if possible, so that it's current enough to be relevant. This being from 2020, we're still okay, but of course more recent data would be preferable. These charts typically expand as well, so when we give them to you, you'll see an image similar to the one, this one, that it has an expand button at the very bottom. This chart gives us the number of hobby, toy, and game establishments per province or territory relevant to the place aspect of the four Ps. If we were opening a retail toy store in St. Boniface, we would want to know how many of these stores are in Manitoba, which you can see in the chart third from the top. You'll also be able to compare the intensity of these stores in other provinces. Unless on most of Ontario's toy stores are in the Northwest, for example, it looks as though Manitoban retail stores will not have much competition from out of province retail sales. Even though this bar chart is quite blurred, we can see that the Canadian expenditure over the years is fairly consistent. Something to consider. This is the average annual household expenditure on children's toys, which doesn't differentiate between households with children and households without. Thus, this graphic seems to show that the average spend is relatively high. In the price portion of the four Ps, this may mean their pricing strategy does not have to be especially low or that they don't necessarily have to compete on price and that their profit margin, so the money that becomes profit after all expenses incurred from selling a specific toy, can be reasonable. A very popular resource we offer is a list of companies. <clears throat> Here you can see there is lots of information. So keep in mind, it will not be the same for each industry. And there will at times be blanks, like in our example, the year founded, sales and employee columns, and possibly even more. Often we look for people in the same industry, which would be your competitors. And other times we look for companies in the same sector or elsewhere that would be potential partners or clients. Notice the NAICS code on the right side of the chart in that rectangle. 
459120 for hobby, toy, and game retailers. So here we're looking at potential competitors. A high concentration of competitors will affect your four Ps. Will your product be fulfilling an unanswered need? With many competitors, it's unlikely unless you could differentiate yourself in some way. If your product is one of many, it becomes commodified, which will negatively affect your pricing strategy. You may have to reduce your profit margin to be able to compete with others. Other information is also available, such as the contact info of company leadership, which would be useful if you're looking for a company with which you'd like to partner. We can narrow down the searches by city or go by province or state, or even as large as by the country. In this last report, we're taking things very macro or local with our demographic search. At the top of this report, you can see the postal code and the address of the potential location. Under profile tables, the heading, you can see different information based on estimates of population, household and income trends and more. Ideally, a retailer such as a toy store would choose an area with a high concentration of their target consumer, but most likely families with children and a high enough household income to sustain little luxuries like a large toy collection. This is a portion of the demogra demographic snapshot for the R2H area, which will let you know who lives there. There is much more information in the report, but it's too large to include in this presentation. The toy store is trying to decide if the 4P's place that they are considering has enough of their target consumer to sustain the business. If there are many families with children, but the population's average household income is low, they may have to change their potential pricing strategy to accommodate their target customer. If not, they may need to work their potential promotional strategy to bring customers to their location or even consider changing the location altogether so that they're in an area with a denser population of their target. I do realize that the vast amounts of info you just consume can be totally daunting and that not everyone can gain access to super expensive databases that hold valuable high quality info and it can take a really long time to find. That's where we come in. We can help you save both time and sanity. We offer totally free one-on-one -on -one consultations with highly skilled advisors and have access and the know-how to find complex information quickly. Find our business info request form at our website, www.wtcwinnipeg.com under business information request so that we can help you get started. Also, mark down on your calendars our upcoming webinars. I referenced this one a little bit earlier. So choosing the right international market, which will take place November 7th at noon. I'm super excited to announce that we have a very special guest, Victoria Uman, who's the director and co-founder of Green and Clean Global, where she will be telling us her story and experiences in marketing and working in foreign markets. Hey, thank you so much for sharing your time. It was an absolute pleasure to present to you. And if we have any questions, I'd like to go through them now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ivanka. That was chock full of information. I'm sure everyone's busting at the seams with uh, information here and hopefully we can help uh, answer some questions. So if you have any, feel free to use the raise hand feature or you could drop your comments in the chat box and I can uh, ask them myself to Ivanka. So to kick things off, I'll get my handy dandy notebook here, Ivanka. And something that came to mind, um, how might place for marketing a mix look for someone running like an online business, like a consultant or an e-commerce type business? You would still target a certain area, right? So for example, Amazon has certain places for certain websites that they have. So Amazon.ca is just for Canada. They have a German version, they have whatever. So each one of those websites tailors specifically to that region. So whether you're doing online or retail or something else, it can all be tailored to place and it is something that you want to take into account. Not only that, you still want to focus on where you're sourcing your products or your supplies or whatever they may be from and where you want to set up even your business function. So where you're going to work yourself. Okay, awesome. Um, if there's no other questions, I've got another one I can ask here. So is there a general rule of thumb for starting with like a push or pull marketing strategy? I'm sure it's uh, it depends type of answer, but if there's any kind of tips or strategies you have around that. The general rule of thumb is if you're already established, then pull marketing is a lot easier because it requires people to search for you, to actively try and find you 
where you just exist more or less and maintain, say, your website, as in the example that I gave. If you're new, you want to participate more in push marketing so that people actually find out who you are, at least initially. So if no one has any more questions, we're going to wrap things up there. Um, and yeah, that was great. Thanks so much, Ivanka. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you. Okay, everyone. That's all we have for today. Have a wonderful rest of your day and rest of your week.